Good morning, church. Welcome again to our online worship service. You know, speaking to a camera is not something that uh, we will ever get used to, uh, but uh, we will have to settle with that for the meantime and trust God uh, that he will still make a way for us with whatever uh, methods that he has made available to us. So thank you for taking time to uh, and your patience uh, in waiting for the day when everything will open up and then we can uh, really worship it with freedom. But even now, our hearts are not bound, so let's continue to exercise that freedom that God has given us in this land to worship him. In my own uh, personal uh, devotional time, I have been reading the Old Testament prophets, starting from uh, particularly Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, and now into Ezekiel. And one of the things that uh, really stand out in all of that history is that Babylonian exile. We probably uh, would be familiar with part of that. And um, it's, but when I read through that, I was wondering to myself, how can that ever make sense to God's people? And yet, God is telling them to go into exile. And not for a short period of time, mind you, but for a period of 70 years. There were false prophets during that time who would tell the people, no worries, you know, just uh, three years and we will get out of here and you will return home. But, uh, you know, the prophets were indicting these false prophets because those were not the words of God. But the words of God was 70 years. To be exiled under a pagan king, a pagan nation, God's people, how can that be? Yet, that was God's portion for them. So as we think about our pandemic and our situation and the continual restrictions, we do not understand why, how is it that we can actually, uh, God can actually allow something like that. Uh, yet, we are told to wait and to wait patiently. So may I encourage you, this is the time to persevere and perseverance will produce that spiritual maturity that God so desires to see in each of us. So take courage, um, brothers and sisters, and I will ask for you uh, to uh, listen to this call to worship, particularly, so why? I'll tell you in a minute. Our call to worship is 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 31 to 32. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice, and let them say among the nations, the Lord is king. Let the sea roar, and all that fills it. Let the field exult, and everything in it. I'm not sure if you observe the all-encompassing uh, reign that God has over all situations. Not just over nature, not just over nations, but more importantly, over our lives. Whether we yield or we do not yield, God still has control over our lives. And we want to praise him for that. So as we move into this time of worship, let's remember, indeed, God is over all. He reigns over all. Whether we admit it, whether men confess it, whether we feel it or not, he is indeed over all. And all praise be given to our God. Amen.
Father God, we just want to thank you that you are indeed over all. As we read in your word over and over again, from page to page, from Genesis to Revelation, Lord, we see your hand at work. Lord, indeed, we may not be able to see with our human eye, but each time as we go through our situations and we look back, we recognize, Lord, that you were in there, in it with us. You were in the vessel with us, even as we go through the storms of life. Father, truly, we just want to thank you that in you we will always find that hope, that hope that moves us on to each day, over each circumstance. And so, Father, I just pray that today as we offer to you our worship, even in listening to your word, in responding to your word, Lord, we pray that we will be a blessed people because we have received your word as you would have for us to receive it in a specific to our circumstances. Lord, we come to you as humble as we can be, Lord, because we recognize that life in itself is so frail, Lord, that we are but a vapor that just disappears in the morning. Lord, we just pray that uh, we will be mindful and have wisdom in counting our days, Lord, so that in so doing, we will make the, each day count for you, dear Lord. And we will serve you in the way that you would guide us, you would lead us to do the things that you would call on us to do, to have that courage, Lord, to take each step together with you, knowing, God, that uh, you are our captain. You are the one who will lead us each step. So, Father, I just pray that uh, we will soften our hearts today. When we hear your word, we will pay heed and we will do your will. And, Father, for those of us who need your healing touch, whether it be physically, emotionally, spiritually, Father, we pray that as we place ourselves before you, Lord, that you will choose to bring about that healing. God, help us not to hold on to the past. Help us to look forward to great things, greater things that you have for us as individuals and as a corporate body in Christ. That God, we will continue to hold out to the hope that you would have for us. Lord, we also pray that, Lord, um, even in the midst of spiritual warfare, Lord, we will remain strong in you. That we will not yield to the evil one, that, but that, God, we will be able to overcome, Lord, no matter what that challenge may be. Because you are with us, you are for us. In your blessed name, Amen.
Today's sermon is about the outcome of forgiveness. How is it going to impact us? We will have to seek the Lord as we hear his word. Let me just read to you. Uh, it's a longer passage, but uh, the passage speaks volumes. And it is really a contrast between two particular individuals in this story. It's taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he cancelled the debts for both of them. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he cancelled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven, hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. May we be blessed by God's word for us today. May we search our hearts to see how his word is going to resonate within our hearts and be lived out, be realized through our lives.
everyone who is uh, online is because of God's great love, His forgiveness, that we are able to be here, to be witnesses for Him. Many men of God, they have to go through what is known as the school of waiting. So we are in this school of waiting for Moses is 40 years, 40 years waiting. God has his own timing. For Joseph, is from the palace to the prison and then back to the palace. Is uh, for David is 15 years in hot pursuit by King Saul. So you just have to hang in there and not give up. And God in his own time, when you have go through that fasting, he after he has done that good work in you, he is faithful, he will bring you through. He who has put you there will also see you through and you will come forth like gold and be ready for his use. So even though we wish everything to be over by yesterday, but then we have to be in step with the Spirit and wait patiently for him to do his work in us. So for this whole series uh, taken from the book of Luke, the last week that we have Jesus there at the party in uh, Luke chapter five, uh, 5, among the tax collectors, among the sinners. But then this week, he was invited to be a special guest among the Pharisees, the people of high standing, people of great influence. So Jesus is no respecter of people. It doesn't matter if you are a nobody or if you are somebody. God loves you and as long as you are willing to open your heart, He's there to receive you, to die with you. And so as we look at this chapter 7 of Luke, we see that uh, God's great love and forgiveness even to the worst of sinners. There is hope. There is no one that is beyond the love and the grace of God as long as they are willing to respond to Him. And it is in this courtyard of the house of Simon the Pharisee the houses of the well-to-do were built round the open courtyard in the form of a hollow square in the days of Jesus. There would be a garden and a fountain and there in the warm weather, meals were eaten. It's just like in the summer, our house out in the garden, people will put up a barbecue pit and they will have meals out there. So, something close to that. So, it was the custom that when a rabbi was at meal in such a house, usually belonging to the well-to-do people, all kinds of people came in. It's a small town, and the whereabout of Jesus the news spread very quickly. And uh, it's like an open house. Uh, people are quite free to do so, to come and listen to the pearls of wisdom which fell from Jesus' lips. Jesus must have become quite popular at this point in his life. 
is a small town and people get to see and witness uh, him in the open air. Uh, he and his disciples uh, traveling, uh, preacher going around, uh, spreading the good news and proclaiming the kingdom of God. And very quickly, news gathered and people gathered and he became very popular. So, uh, this explains the presence of the woman. So, when a guest enters such a house, uh, the host will show that hospitality. There are three basic things that has to be done. First, the host will place his hand on the guest's shoulder and give him a holy kiss of peace. Of course, today we don't do that, but in some parts of Europe, people still give a, a, a kiss on the cheek, you know, but not now. Because of the pandemic, you just do elbow to elbow or use your fist you know, and uh, try to kind of distance yourself so socially. But then, um, that was what they do. Uh, it was a mark of respect which was never omitted in the case of a distinguished rabbi. So we know that in those days the roads were no good. They were very dusty. So the roads were only dust tracks and shoes were merely soles held in place by straps across the foot. So they don't have good shoes or shoe shops that you can go to and shop uh, for your Christmas gift uh, or New Year present. They were very, all very basic. So always cool waters was poured over the guest's feet to cleanse and to comfort them. As they walk on the dusty road, uh, the feet most likely will be caked with dust or even mud during the rainy season. So the, it's courteous on the part of the host to have a basin of water and to, uh, when the guests, before they enter into the house, to help to clean the feet and to make the guests comfortable. And either a pinch of sweet-smelling incense was burned or a drop of perfume was placed on the guest's head. So these things are good manners demanded. And in the case, in the case of Simon, as a host, none of that was offered. So as to why he invited Jesus to be his guest is also interesting. It's quite likely that Simon was a collector of celebrities. Just like if you were to visit some hotels today, they have the photo shots of many of these VIP. You know? uh, maybe the prime minister or the president that have visited the hotel and they put it up there uh, out for people to see, to notice how credible and how uh, good the hotel is. So it's quite possible that Simon, uh, knowing the, popul uh, the popularity of Jesus, and he may have other celebrities that come and dine with him so that he can boast to others. Uh, so there was this uh, half patronizing contempt. He had invited this young Galilean to have a meal with him. There was a strange combination of certain respect for Jesus, but with the omission of the usual courtesies that are accorded to important guests. So the woman, as according to the scriptures, heard about Jesus. Most likely, even before coming to the house, and uh, she must be tired of living a sinful life. 
And here Jesus, sinners, they were attracted to him. He represents to them that change, that hope. Jesus brings about that restoration and that healing. And therefore, the woman heard about Jesus and he wanted to pay Jesus, Jesus a visit. The woman, as he said, was a bad woman, a notoriously bad woman, a prostitute. I think this woman, as picture here, can go no lower in his position, in her position. Recited by the normal, the traditional Jewish man at the beginning of the daily morning prayers. That means usually the traditional Jewish man or rabbi in the beginning of the day when they pray, this is what they will pray. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who has not created me a woman, a Gentile, hidden, or a slave. So, women are not well valued in such a society. And this is a woman, but not just an ordinary woman, but a bad woman, a notoriously bad woman, a prostitute, the lowest class in society, despised along with tax collectors. Imagine one Sunday morning, uh, we can have this in-person gathering again, and in come this famous, notorious call girl coming to church for service. What would the reactions of the people be? What? Probably many men and women would feel uneasy trying to keep that social distancing. Yeah. That is not uh, implemented by the government, but it's self-imposed. Um, that reminds me of an incident in a church when this um, homeless guy appeared for the Sunday service, morning service, and he walked into the church and there was a big uproar. The usher was in uh, confusion as to where this homeless guy should be seated. He's not allowed to usher him to the front because that will disturb many people, many elders and seniors. Neither is she allowed him to be uh, in between the pew because there are people feeling very uncomfortable uh, and debating among themselves that uh, this guy is not smelling good and uh, uh, he should be put right at the back of the pew. And interestingly, uh, the Salvation Army Church was started because a lot of the souls that was brought to the church, so-called the high society church, they were not well received in a normal church. And so General Bull founded the Salvation Army to allow the street people, those who are saved by the army, to be received into this church. But the irony is that today, even our church has become so successful and so comfortable that we are not comfortable with people who are different from us. We are only comfortable with people of our kind, but not people of a different kind. 
So the, the presence of this lady must have aroused much turmoil, gossips, much surprise and even shock and disapproval. It takes a lot of courage even for a woman of her standing to even to come into the crowd knowing very well that she will not be well received. But she has that strong determination. There was no mention about the name of this woman. He may even be a homeless person in contrast to the established and rich Pharisee. But then Jesus has a lesson to teach us. No doubt she has listened to Jesus speak from the edge of the crowd and she must have glimpsed in him the hand which could lift her from that sinful, vicious cycle. And then round her neck, she wore, like all Jewish women, a bottle of concentrated perfume. They were very costly. And she wished to pour that nice perfume onto the feet of Jesus. For it was all that she could afford to offer. And when she did that, can you imagine the perfume, just the fragrance just spread throughout the whole place. And that is what true worship is all about. She gave her very best to Christ. As she saw him, the savior of the world, the tears came. She was so amazed and feel so well accepted by Jesus that she fell upon his feet. So for a Jewish woman to appear with the hair unbound was an act of the gravest immodesty. On her wedding day, a girl bound up her hair so tightly, pulling back that she could hardly close her eyes. And never would she appear with it unbound again. But this woman was bearing her soul before Christ. She was exhibiting that true form of worship. She was worshipping Jesus unreservedly, having been so engrossed in the act of worship that she had forgotten everyone else around her except Jesus. But the people, they were not worshipping Jesus. They were busy criticizing her. Jesus was not the object of their worship, but Jesus has become the object of criticism. So, it's so often that in a worship service, we are so conscious of everything and everyone except Jesus. But this woman is different. He exemplified for us what it means to worship Christ. A great act of worship served as a well-pleasing sweet aroma unto God, though it brought much discomfort to the critics. Instead of busy worshipping, they were busy criticizing. So the story demonstrates a contrast between the two attitudes of mind and heart. Simon was conscious of no need and therefore felt no love and so received no forgiveness. Simon's impression of himself was that he was a good man in the sight of man and God. But the, the woman was conscious of nothing else than a desperate need and therefore was overwhelmed with love for him, Jesus Christ, who could supply and so receive forgiveness. The one thing that shuts a man off from God is that self-sufficiency. 
Simon was too self-sufficient. So Jesus used a commercial figure to illustrate his lesson. One debtor owed 50 didaris. One didaris is worth about one day wages. So 50, probably 50 day wages. And another, um, that is uh, referring indirectly to the woman. Uh, Simon felt that the woman was 10 times the sinner that he was. He would admit that he was a sinner, but not as bad as the woman. The other debtor owed a 500 didaris, referring to Simon. So 10 times that of Simon, 10 times that of the woman. So, uh, being 10 times less than the former, then Jesus introduced a most unusual note in his parable. The money lender referring to himself, knowing that both the debtors had anything to pay. Forgive them both, right off. The debts. So one is 50 and one is 500, which is about 500 days of wages. That is almost close to probably one and a half years. So the, this was purely an act of grace on the part of the creditor. So Jesus was asking a question. When asked which would love the creditor more, Simon admitted that the man to whom most was forgiven would fear the greatest degree of obligation. So the one who is forgiven the most will be more obligated to the creditor. So the sins of the woman were many and she knew it. So did Christ. But he here proclaimed in naked term the forgiveness of all her sins. She was forgiven not on the basis of her tears, her works, her kisses, her perfume, but her faith in Christ's love and compassion. Because Jesus said that your faith has saved you, not your work. So go in peace. Simon sinned, but he didn't know that, and there was no evidence that he repented of his sin. So the Bible does say in James 4 verses 6 to 7, God resisted or opposes the proud, but he gave his grace to the humble. So that one thing that stands between us and God is our pride. When we are too proud, when we are too self-sufficient, that will stand in the way between us and God. The woman was desperately conscious that she needed forgiveness, but not Simon. So one of the gravest mistakes we make is to equate grave sins with the outward acts, drunkenness or adultery or crime but not sins like what is in our heart. But God searches the heart and God looks at the heart. The selfishness, meanness, sarcastic pride, overcritical tongue, irritabilities, or moodiness. Simon was every bit as bad a sinner as the woman was, and perhaps much worse but he did not know it. In reality, it is quite possible for someone who is always in church, rich in Christian heritage, to be just as lost as someone who has never been to church. So a modern day Simon may be a prominent member of a certain club, active and respected member of a church, excellent model of success, 
he may ostracize himself from people of a different caliber and status, fearful that those pagans or heathens who are rough and sensual, living only for the day, may contaminate him because he claims himself to be morally upright, religious, cultured, well-educated, so he relates only to those of his status and caliber. But the strange thing in the spiritual realm is that the better a man is, the more he feels his sin. Paul could speak of sinners of whom he was the chief. St. Francis of Assisi could say that there is nowhere a more wretched and a more miserable sinner than I. So in the small cemetery of a parish churchyard in England stand a granite tombstone with the following inscription, John Newton, clerk, once an infidel, libertine, a servant of slavers in Africa, by the rich mercy of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he has long laboured to destroy. The man who composed the Amazing Grace hymn. So until the time of his death at the age of 82, he never ceased to marvel at God's mercy and grace that has so dramatically changed his life. And on one occasion before his death, he is quoted as saying, My memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things. That I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great saviour. Amen. It is true to be said that the greatest of sin is to be conscious of no sin. But a sense of a need will open the door to the forgiveness of God. Because God is love. Someone has an imaginative reconstruction or what we have the year before, the last year, 2020, Christmas reimagined. So here you may say it's Calvary reimagined of what happened to Barabbas after the crowd chose him to be set free and so sent Jesus to the cross. That passage, the story can be read in Matthew chapter 27, verses 15 to 26. After the verdict, it said that Barabbas followed Jesus to Calgary to see what would happen. And when the nails were driven through Jesus' hand, one thought was in Barabbas' mind. These nails would have been driven through my hands, not his. He saved me. And when he saw Jesus finally hanging on the cross, one feeling was in Barabbas' heart. I should have been hanging there, not he, <coughs> but he saved me. Every one of us should identify with Barabbas because it is your sins and my sins that sent him to the cross. He took your place and my place. Sada, an African, was a soldier. Seduced by a love or a fascination for weapons and a thirst for battle. But he was seduced by the desire for material wealth. So he quit the army to take his battle to the streets as an armed robber. So with fellow gang members, he thrilled in terrorizing and robbing at gunpoint residents and motorists in downtown. Then shortly he was caught and given a death sentence. That shocked him. Overwhelmed with despair, he pleaded for miracles and believed in Jesus. So despair and doubt give way to peace, joy and hope for the future. Miraculously, 
his death sentence was reduced to a three-year sentence, which he had already served. After having experienced the grace of God, he gave himself to the full-time ministry. You need not to be a robber before you go into full-time ministry. Or like John Newton, he could say, I'm a great sinner, but Christ is a great saviour. So the greatest of sins is to be conscious of no sin. So in the parable of the two debtors and the creditors, we see that we are all bankrupts and debtors in the sight of our heavenly creditor. Even the best among us, like the worst among us, have nothing to pay our debt. But Jesus, he saved us by taking our place. When we turn to him in faith, we shall be forgiven. For as far as the east is from the west, so will I forgive your sin. Even if it's as scarlet, but then the snow, I will wash away your sin and make them as white as snow. As in recent days, we see a lot of snow coming. For those living in the snow belt, uh, we will get a picture of what it's like. Uh, so refreshing uh, as God in his power is able to wash away all our sin and make them as white as snow. If forgiven, what are the results of forgiveness? Then love and devotion to the one who forgives should be ours. Free from the burdensome death of our sin, our gratitude must not be like Simon, the critic, but like the woman, that avid, devout worshipper all the rest of our life, manifesting a life of holiness and the service for the bringing of others to him who alone can save us. So as you bow your heads, search your hearts, who are you? You have a choice. Are you more like Simon or are you more like the unknown woman? Are you guilty of judging and condemning others whom Christ has forgiven and accepted? Or are you willing to accept the forgiveness of Jesus and therefore you can enjoy the freedom and the peace of his forgiveness? Where do you see yourself in the parable? Or what do you see yourself in the parable? Something for us to ponder over as we study the parable. And may the Lord help us. Amen. Father God, we just want to commit this whole session into your mighty hands. Search our hearts. Help us to realize and to be more like the woman that you have forgiven so that we can worship you in spirit and in truth so that we can be a true worshiper in the house of God and to bring more of others to yourself because you are the only one that can forgive and that can bring salvation. We thank you for this privilege, for your um, choosing us to be your vessels. We thank you and we praise you for your mercies and your forgiveness. Amen.
you again for joining us. I pray that you have been blessed by the word of God preached today. I pray that you will also be blessed by uh, the songs uh, that we have put on today for the service. And I want to especially mention, um, not so much to embarrass Sean, but I just want to thank Sean for his uh, faithful service in the midst of all that we need to do. Uh, thank God for using him to make this possible, even during this time of restrictions. So go with God's blessings. Know that he is ever before us. He is on our right. He's on our left. He's behind us. He's before us. He's above us. We praise God. So be blessed with this benediction in Jude 1, 20 to 21. But you, beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Look forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Hallelujah. See you again next week. May you have a God-blessed, spirit-filled week ahead of you.